Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. <coughs> the morning yeah, flew by. Huh? Uh huh? I said the morning flew by. <laughs> Just whoosh, gone. <laughs> it always does on Mondays, I'll tell you. It, it does. It's really, I get involved in so many because I have a whole long list that I seem to have to stack up for Monday and it just the list is getting longer and longer so there yeah you go. so I'm gonna shrink you here just a second I need to <clears throat> find you you have hosts so I can probably jump off sure that would be great okay yeah I'm just looking class. for the material for the class today here oh i put it in the text i i know it's i just i'm bringing it up to share oh is what i'm what i'm trying to do i got it gotcha. so yeah so that's good thank you for helping me i appreciate it absolutely see you later yeah have a good i'll see you too okay bye yeah Hi, Tamara. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? Uh, did you, you didn't get that deal, I take it? No, um, 
they had some bids come in at like mid 630s. The list price was 605. Wow. And they kind of thought they wouldn't get it, but it was like a good trial run and to kind of see where everything's at and if they need to do like a little bit less so they can offer more like find a house of like 570 so they can go up and offer a little bit more. Sure. That's a great so, idea. Well, it, it's a learning curve <laughs> for them all. Yeah. But um yeah, so it was fine. They weren't like dying yeah, if they didn't get that particular house, you know? <laughs> yes. And there they have go. time. They're right. not moving out until July, the beginning of July. So they started early, which is really good. Yes, because it may take them till June to get something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it also gives you your upside down there, Holly. <laughs> Uh oh, I'm upside down. <laughs> yeah, you are upside down. There you go. Hi, Miss Amy. Oh, she's not on there yet. Hello, Miss Amy. Okay. Here we go. Amy, Amy uh, Holly, you're you're right side up. You're good. Yeah. Today. <laughs> this is good, better. Good girl. There's, <laughs> that helps. And a Amy is new. And there you go. Good job, Amy. You got a chance to get in. Good job. Okay. Well, we're going to take off and work our magic here. Um, so I am going to share my screen. All everybody knows that they can go <clears throat> to your Gmail account. Go to your six dots on the right, click on that, go to my drive, type in the words resource, and right below it should pop, pop up resources for Park Meadows. And all the stuff we're talking about is there. If you have troubles, give a, give a shout out to Amy and she'll help you with that. So what we have here first is our documents that we buy, do for the buyers brokerage disclosure or the definitions or working relationship. This is then the next one is your buyer agency agreement, buyer advisory, which comes from Damien and chain of, change of status if needed. That means that if you go from an, a buyer's agent to a transaction broker, you have to do what they call a change of status document. Then there are a lender letter that goes in the under contract portion in command and you have the MLS printout sheet um, that it, that'll be in your MLS. Your realist information comes from the MLS. Now, Amy and Holly both have classes to take from RE Colorado, but um, see when you can fit those in to the best of your ability. Uh, I don't know if they've got them recorded or not. If you have a counter offer, copy of your earnest money check and receipt, uh, inspection objection and resolution, uh, seller's property disclosure, square foot disclosure, uh, source of water, it may or may not come from the other agent, and in closing instructions, which may or may not come from the other agent, and a lead-based paint disclosure if it's needed for a house that was built January 1, 1978. So post-closing occupancy, if it's the, if, if needed, you put that in. And you, a new commission agreement, if it's a FISBO or a new home, uh, all that goes in. Short sale might be needed. So then you go to command, you go to command and commission request, fill that out when you upload all these documents. Don't upload your documents under who's typing, who's typing. Oh, Amy, mute, mute yourself if you could. Thank you. Um, the uh, don't upload until you get to inspection resolution. Um, to upload all the documents and then I can and submit it to me and then I'll review it, improve it so you can close. When you get your closing documents, these are from the title company. You Then you upload your documents for the title company, copies of checks or distribution sheet and sold MLS. You'll see that breakdown in command. So our first document is the definitions of working relationship. All of these you can find, all these documents you can find in CTME or in DocuSign. 
So our next document is the agency agreement. So you check your box, your buyer's agent, put your date on it. On 2.1, you always check multiple person uh, uh, firm. <coughs> you, put the, you put the buyer's legal name in and hang on just a minute. We have another person. So just a second. Okay. All right. So now you put um, the legal name of your buyers. It should be filled in for Keller Williams. You should have the broker's name, which is you, on 3.5. Oh, we lost Holly again. Holly, are you back in again? I'm, going, I'm getting on my PC instead of my phone so I can see better. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. I'll let you in. You're good. Thanks. Yep. Um, on 3.4, you put down the buyer's next principal resident, whether the MLS multi-listing service, FISBOs for sale by owners, property, investment property, or new home. You can also put land in here if you want. Um, but that statement should be in all your buyer agency agreements. This way you can cover all your bases. You've got it all covered. Then on 3.6, you have a beginning and ending date in your uh, always, and I would put it six months with based on our, could be nine months right now based on what price point everybody's in, but at least six months because it's very hard to get properties these days on 3.6. On 3.8.2, uh, it can be will or will not to extend to the next day, if it's a Saturday, Sunday, or holiday. It's up to you. Brokerage relationship, you go to 4.3.1.2 buyer, agent only, and that means you represent them, not anybody else, okay? Your fiduciary is to your buyers. Then <clears throat> brokerage duties that cannot be deleted, by the way. On five, those are all things that you need to understand and make sure that you know that this, be familiar with them. You don't have to um, memor memorize them, but you just be, need to be familiar with them. Now, because you have checked the box at the top, number six, if you're gonna get fired uh, as a buyer's agent, um, one through three here and number six are where you're going to get fired. Promote the interest of the buyer, seeking price and terms uh, uh, for the buyer and count, uh, counseling the buyers on material benefit and risk. This is where a lot of the times meeting of the minds is not always there. So you want to be sure that you have a good meeting of the minds. Who's supposed to be doing what? What does that entail? What does it look like? If you sit down and have a buyer consultation, you usually have less issues with this. You always want to make sure your buyer is getting as, uh, uh, as approved as they possibly can preferably make sure that they only have to find a house, get an inspection appraisal, and they're moving forth. It's vitally important that you do that. Then you go down to um, 7.1.1. You can put your success fee is 2.8. Um, then uh, you check others. And any bonus or any greater commission should be paid to Keller Williams Real Estate LLC at the time of closing. Always put that in there. Now, a lot of times you're going to see advertised in the MLS 2.2 or 2%, 2.2, 2 2.5. I've never charged a buyer anything other than what was advertised, but that is up to you whether you want to do that or not. Uh, the rest of it go all the way down to 7.1.4. None at this time is the words you want to put in there. Then on 7.2.4, it's lease, always want to put that in there just in case it's just an FYI type thing. And then you go uh, 7.3.2, list, uh, listing brokerage firm or buyer, a seller must pay, buyer is obligated to pay. I've never exercised this particular paragraph. However, um, it's always good to start with that unless somebody doesn't want to do if buyer, if you, you might, they may not want to go down to 7.3.3 because that just take whatever is advertised. Um, that's the best policy not to get your buyers mad at you. 7.4 is the holdover period. You can do 30, 60, 90, 120, whatever you want. And you will uh, submit 
uh, if they've gone to any houses or put an offer in any houses you've shown them, you could be owed a commission. Now there's a lot of steps getting there, but keep track of whatever you show your buyers. So in case there is a holdover period, you know what exactly you've shown them, okay? Then um, uh, number nine, the broker's obligation, obligation um, is not currently in any, this is important, you're not currently in any agreement with any other broker. And you have not received a list submitting properties pursuant to the previous listing agreements. So this is important if they've fired another agent, make sure you know what they've seen, okay? So we go down to 10 is pretty self-explanatory. 11, 12, 12 is, is brokerage service. Uh, if there's something different, you can put none at this time. You want to put done 12 as per the MLS instructions. And here's the area that you're going to show them. So it could be multi-listing service in the Denver metro area, Colorado Springs, or Fort Collins area. So be specific if it's outside of the metro area. Make sure you put that in your listing agreement. Disclose the identity. Uh, uh, number 11 is um, the buyer's permission to disclose the third party. So uh, the answer is yes. So to say yes, that does have the uh, to a uh, listing agent or somebody else. A lot of times an athlete or somebody who's famous doesn't want their identities disclosed right now until they make an offer. So um, it, it's just something that normally is does, but it, on rare occasion it'll be do, do not. So 14 all the way down to 20 is pretty self-explanatory. Please read it, understand it, that type of thing. And on 21, we don't put a lot in here, but you could put down that you have a transaction broker who's going to follow the paperwork and the broker, the, the selling agent, uh, the broker is going to pay for it. Or you might put nothing in here at the moment, okay? What attaches to this document is the buyer advisory and definitions of working relationship. It could be a brokerage uh, disclosure also. This is what you attach. That's your first email when you're talking to your buyers. They get the, we'll get to the advisory in a second. You get the, the disclosure and then you get the document we're talking about now. And the last one is buyer agency. The rest of this all the way from 23 all the way down to where everybody signs. Put their legal name in here so that when you put it and marry it to the buy-sell contract, it will be the same, okay? So here is the buyer advisory that our in-house attorney um, put together. It's four pages long or six pages long, I'm sorry for the buyer. Um, and it's about earnest money dispute. It's about uh, disclosures, inspections, it's about you know anything that's uh, on the property, stigmatized situations, septic tanks, fraud, surveys, home warranties, title, personal property, what they're explaining, the uh, seller's possessions at closing, et cetera. Read this whole thing, you'll understand it better, but it will keep you out of trouble. So all the buyers sign and you sign on this document, okay? Now we get to the buy-sell contract, which is the meat and the potatoes. Now, the first email you send to a buyer at, or at your consultation, they go ahead and sign those three documents we just talked about. Now we found a property. Now we're going to put an offer in. And our first thing is, is the legal name of the buyer. We're going to have joint tenants um, if they are married. Uh, tenants in common uh, could be as a percentage other means subtlety or, or a single. So you have to ask your uh, buyers what do they want to take it in? And the way you explain joint tenants is this right of survivorship. Usually on a second marriage is tenants in common and others is just single or subtlety. And then you put in the legal name of the do uh, which whatever shows up in realist, that's the name of the seller. You have the county in which the property is located. You have the legal description of the property. You have the address of the property. Now, you have inclusions and exclusions. Um, you have, this is a little different than it was last year. You always want to put the exact amount of the uh, remotes. 
if you have one garage, two garage, three, you put accordingly. So, but don't just use the word any and all or what the MLS says or anything like that. Be specific. If you have something that's included in your, in your listing, such as a, that is on a lease, like a, um, a solar panel, water softener, uh, seller's um, a security system, or a, light, uh, a, a satellite, we'll put more in farther down, um, we'll get into putting the information in. But at this point, you've got to check the box that's appropriate. If there's nothing in there with these things, then you don't have to check a box. So what's excluded, you can read that from the MLS. Other inclusions, read this from the MLS or whatever you see, be specific. If you don't know the brand, make sure you know where the free standing gas stove and refrigerator are located in the kitchen, the GE ice maker in the basement or whatever it is, curtain rods, whatever it is. Be sure you're ex you know, exact, uh, very exact of what's staying. Then on 2.5.4 are encumbrance uh, uh, ex exclusions. Right now it's none. Um, you have parking facilities on 2.5.6. And the reason I have you fill this out, I know there's a three car garage. I know there's a shed in the back. However, if you're so used to blowing by this particular um, uh, doc, this uh, paragraph, and you were in a condo or townhome, you forget to ask the questions of the listing agent. Is there a garage? Is it underground? Ground? Is it a detached garage? Is there a storage shed? Is there a storage um, uh, closet or whatever they want to call it? But it triggers the question to ask, okay? Now, if you have a leased item, so we were up here on the solar panels, so now we're getting to the leased items, solar lease for the sellers. Uh, solar panels are currently installed on the property. Make sure you put that in there. And then you have uh, exclusions, maybe washer dryer in the upstairs laundry room. Normally under water rights, we don't have any. So you can put the word none after the first one. If there is a well and you know what the permit is, you put it right here. You water stocks, normally you don't have any. Water right review. This is whether there's a right, if water are gonna convey, um, you wanna put down does not have the right to terminate or does have the right to terminate if they're going to have a water go convey to the new buyer. This is important, it's a new paragraph in the listing agreement. So now we have dates and deadlines, which we will not do next week. We will do the following week. I will not be teaching class next week, just so you know. I have a, a class to take myself. So um, all the way down to 3.3.3. .3 um, and you want to put will or will not extend over a holiday. That's up to you. Four, now you should know what the price that's going to be offered. On the earnest money, that will be in your MLS. Um, and you know from talking to the lender what the new loan is. And the difference would be the cash that the buyer has to bring for closing. So they're putting 3% down, 5% down, 10% down, or 20% down. You have to learn that from the lender. And the lender should be able to tell you what these uh, numbers should be, okay? Um, on 4.3, you are going to give a personal check. Um, you don't have to do certified funds or anything like that. Personal check would be fine. Um, and it's going to be made out to the agency or a title company here. Then we go down. Um, I want you to read uh, 4.3.1 all the way down to 4.5.1. Those are important. And then we go down to 4.5.3. What type of loan are you getting? Please only check one. Conventional FHA, VA, you got to know what if, if it's a high price, you have to know if VA or FHA are going to make that high price and if they're going to conventional. 
If they check the box conventional and switch to FHA, you need to do an amend extend informing the seller that you're doing that and, and make sure you get their permission because there are costs within FHA and VA the buyers cannot uh, pay and they run anywhere from 50 to about $350 a month uh, 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 at closing. So when your buyer gets to um, select the kind of loan, make sure that they can qualify that. If they've got a change, make sure that which is the least affecting of a buyer that they may want to put in, in their offer. You can, in CTME, and I think you can do the same in DocuSign, you can delete 4.6 and 4.7. They don't really apply currently. And now we go to the, lo to the uh, loan financing. The first date you have to understand is loan, uh, new loan application. This deadline is to say, I'm going to, when you make your offer and your ex, let's say today is Monday, if they accept your offer today, tomorrow or the next day could be your new loan application uh, dead, deadline in your dates and deadlines. You don't have a complete application until you're ad, there's an address and a legal description of a property. Those are the rules the lenders have to abide by. So you have, you get an offer, it's accepted, and there's a date in the contract that has to be given to the uh, loan officer and he can complete the application deadline. The new term deadline is saying, hey, Mr. Buyer, you're gonna get a 10% down F, uh, conventional loan and at uh, 4%. And they have a three to five day period of time to say yes or no to that loan. If they say yes to it and sign the documents and the date goes past, they cannot get out of the contract on loan terms. This is very, very important to remember. It's important to have a three to seven business day situation here. And it needs to be that once you've signed this, and once you've agreed to it, Mr. Buyer, you cannot get out of the contract on loan terms. Your new loan availability means whatever they agree to in 5.2.1, now they have a deadline, usually it's a week before closing, to say, hey, I can get that or no, I can't. You can't get out of a, lo a loan on this situation anymore as quickly as you could before. So it's important that you make sure your buyers are, have got their lender information and everything is exactly as it should be. So you have credit. These are just general pieces of information on 5354. Now we're going to appraisals. On 621 uh, is your conventional. If you can't agree and there's an objection, you can terminate. On 6.2.1.3, uh, that again, that's all dealing with conventionals in this between 6.2.1 all the way to 6.2.1.3. That regards to con uh, conventional. Uh, basically says, hey, if it doesn't come in, you have a, the buyer objects, the seller doesn't have to sell at whatever price it is, okay? 6.2.2 is an FHA. So if this amount that you're offering, you have to put in where the zero is, you got to put that amount in there. And that's what an appraiser looks like who's doing an FHA appraisal. And it come, doesn't come in at the agreed upon selling price, the buyer does not have to purchase the property, period. Okay, in the conventional level, it could be negotiated. It usually, to be honest, a lot of times it could be negotiated down to whatever that appraised value is, because most times in FHA and VA pre, uh, uh, buyers are not bringing money to the closing table, extra money to the table. So when you when you list a property, be sure you've got a good listing number so you don't have to fight the appraisal. Okay. So now we get down to 6.4. Who's paying for it? Normally it's the buyer. Not nor, you know, normally there isn't, that's one of their closing costs. And that'll run from anywhere from 450 to 700. Now on seven is the homeowners association. All of paragraph seven 
the listing agent, if there's an HOA, has to furnish to the buyer. And it's a, there, there's a deadline in the contract for that. So it all that number seven is what's going to given, been given, be given to the buyers. Any questions so far? Okay, break time for my, my voice. Hang on. Now on number eight is your title. When you check the box 8.1.1, seller selects, seller pays. Buyers also get a title insurance for the title for the lender. And that's uh, the seller pays the greater portion, which is two to uh, anywhere from 18 to $2,200. The buyer's portion is about 15 to $1,800. Now, if a buyer checks 8.1.2, that means he will buy his 18 to 20, or I mean, yeah, 17 to 22. $100, he'll pay that fee and he'll pay the seller's fee. So that adds another $2,200, to $2,200 onto their closing costs. So be careful how you use these two paragraphs. It does look more enticing if the buyer selects, the buyer will select the title company and will pay. That means both documents is going to add $2,200 to the closing costs. On 8.1.3, you always check will. It's only about 35 bucks. And if the seller doesn't pay, it, you can always pay as an agent, but you always want to get it because here's what happens. <clears throat> if you do not put this on here, and this is a true story. There was a uh, house in the Tempers and it was $875,000. Uh, listing agents in Remax office, um, selling agents a call banker. Now they go to closing. The seller gets a three hundred seventy-five dollar check. Agent Remax gets his commission. Agent Cole Banker gets hers, and the buyer gets the keys. A week later, there's a knock on the door. These are the people um, from the uh, state of Colorado telling the buyer he does not own the property because that listing agent, the Remax agent did not get an owner extended policy. The seller was one step ahead of a federal bench warrant. So needless to say, there were lawsuits and I'm pretty sure the Colwell Banker lady lost her license on this one. It was a mess and that's a true story. <clears throat> so that is a very, very important box. If the seller doesn't wanna pay, make sure you do, but it's got to be on there because the day before, the day of, and the day after, you can't see those are blind dates if you don't check this box. So anybody can sneak in there and put a lien on the property. That's what happened the state. If they had had owner extended policy, they'd have never closed. It would have never gotten to that point, but lawsuits were everywhere. So it was a mess. So number eight, all the way down through all of eight deals with title, all kinds of title. Then you go to 8.9. This is if the property has mineral that is going to be, be conveyed to a buyer. Most of the time it does not. But once in a great while, if you get something out where Tamara lives, it could be on 5, 10, 40 acres, whatever the number is. It might be conveyed uh, with the buyer, okay? So it's important that the buyer has time to review. But in most cases, and I would check it, you don't, if you're in a subdivision like Highlands Ranch or somewhere else, it doesn't usually apply, okay? Then on number nine is your survey. On a house, I would always put down, check the box, new improvement location certificate. Uh, you fill it out as I've got it here, the seller to pay uh, and uh, get an ILC or survey seller and then buyer's lender buyer and buyer's lender get the, the results. This paragraph is only used if the lender and or the title company require a new ILC or a new survey. Now, exception to this is if you have are selling a piece of land that has a lot uh, acreage in it, I would always ask for a new survey and have the seller give it. Now the seller may have one that he will give you and then you do an amend extend and accept the old survey. But at this point, 
when you're doing a lot in block is you get an ILC. Once in a while on an acre or two, you might get a low improvement location plat. But um, the bottom line is, is that always put this in. You do not have to put this in if it's a condo or a townhome because they, they usually don't, you don't do surveys for those, okay? Um, we did have a situation, please, the other side, the, the selling side or the list, I mean, the listing side may not understand what this paragraph is. So it's not always used if they wanna take the dates out, depending on where the location is, it could be, but you have to remember if the title company and or the lender says somebody's got to pay for a new survey or a new, uh, a new ILC, that's going to become a problem. So I always put the dates in here just to be sure and cover ourselves, but not in a condo and not in a townhome. Okay. Number 10, this is our due diligence inspection. So we have seller's property disclosure. Your, your, you, you have agents who put in selling as is or whatever. You already have it in 10 to, you don't need to reiterate it. But most agents don't read these contracts, so they don't know it's already there. They uh, keep putting extra work into the additional provisions. So anyway, inspections, you can have any kind of inspection you want, as long as you don't destroy the property and you put it back to its original condition. On 10.5 is the insurability. And you usually put that in close to your inspection, objection, or termination deadline. Your due diligence, this is where people like to put crap into the contract. But if you've checked the box that you have a lease anything, the lease agreement for the solar panels have another 15 years on the lease. Um, and then you could also put in there by seller wants buyer to assume. And then you want to be sure that you understand what is it going to take to assume that loan. So you have to do some homework on those leased items, okay? Then you have to put down, uh, will assume the lease uh, seller's obligation if you want, you check it, or will not. Um, most sellers want them to assume it. Most buyers do not want to assume it. So if they can assume it, check the box, okay? Again, that's information you have to get from the seller or from the lease information. Now you have to say the encumbrance, encumbrance on that uh, lease will or will not be assumed. In this case, the seller says, I want the buyer to assume. Most of the time the buyer's gonna say, I don't wanna assume because it's another debt for the buyer. So <clears throat> these paragraphs are important. This is what the, buy, the seller wants. And when you write a, when you're buying these, um, when you're doing this buy-sell contract, you have to ask the, the buyers, do you want to assume? If you don't, then check the box will not on both of these cases. But you've got to be sure that you check with the buyers and the lenders to see if they can actually assume the payment. Okay. Then you don't have any other document or information in there. If you want to ask for your manuals for the refrigerator, stove, washer, dryer, whatever staying, Put that into additional provisions, not in this paragraph, guys. Okay, 10.8, um, it's your water source and there's no will. You can check does not acknowledge receipt of, of the seller's property disclosure and there's no will. Now you have laid miss paint disclosure. We, you, we've got that. If it needs to be signed, you have a date that has to be signed and given back. On 10.11, uh, carbon monoxide detectors must be within 15 feet of all the sleeping areas. And it is a Colorado state law that it is required to be on the property at the time of listing. Now there's many agents that don't know about this law. I don't know how it's about 15 years old, but it's got to be in there and it must be in there before the appraiser goes in or there's going to, uh, the appraiser will stop the appraisal and come back and it'll be another trip charge to the buyers. We don't have a meth uh, disclosure, um, other companies do, but we don't. This is just a paragraph saying um, basically what meth is and what, a, what, what the problems are. Closing instructions, we have closing instructions are not executed with the contract. I'll tell you where to put that in a minute. Now, who's delivering? Who controls this listing? Our in place is always controlled by the listing agent, guys. It's not mutual agreement. It's always the listing agent, okay? 
on three is how are you going to transfer title? It is always special warranty deed with some rare exceptions. It might be personal representative deed, but right now it's always special warrant, which means the seller only warrants for the time that they own it. Okay. Now we're getting into other fees uh, that are, are added on uh, to the um, uh, buyer and seller. 15.2 is half buyer and half seller. That's the fee that the seller, the, the uh, title company charges the uh, seller and buyer to close the real estate side and the mortgage side. So it usually runs anywhere from 250 to 500. You have to call, you either ask the other agent what it is, or you'll see it on the closing instructions. Now, many agents don't provide the Colorado State approved closing instructions. So it may not be there. So you're gonna to have to find out what that cost is, okay? Now we have homeowners association fees. If there is a homeowners association, who's gonna pay for the status letter? Well, if I represent the buyer, I check seller. Now, if you wanna make it enticing for the buyer, for the seller, then you can put buyer. That's up to what your discussion is with your buyer. Recording fees, the same way, if I represent the buyer, I put seller, but if you're going to try to get the deal and add more cost on to the buyer for closing, you can check uh, buyer. Now we're doing work at a working capital, that can be anywhere from 150 to $1,000. So you have maybe like to try to find out what that is. If you can't, and are you gonna check buyer or are you gonna check seller? That's a decision you guys have to make. Other fees, closing fees, uh, again, you can say seller 50-50 or buyer or not at all. Uh, local transfer fees are usually NA, but I just wanna be sure if there is one, the seller's gonna pay for it. Sales, tax, sales usage tax is something else that a buyer pays, buyer seller. There aren't any down here, but they are in the high country. I say with the private transfer fee, the high country has it, down here we do not. On 15.7 is water transfer fee. It's somewhere around two to 350. Check the box, make sure you know what it is. It's a water district. Here in Colorado, in Islands Ranch, it's the uh, uh, community water. So that would be this little box right there. And who's paying for it, who, again, which one you make a decision on which one you wanna do. You know, utility transfer is a new fee. We don't know what those charges are. They could be 50 to whatever, I don't know. So you always wanna check who's gonna pay that fee if it's gonna be there. Some of the utilities companies have them, some of them don't. FERPA is um, basically saying my, my, uh, the seller is a uh, foreign national and that's usually the title company knows that. So do not check that box, please. Uh, on 15.9.2, this is the uh, paragraph that deals with the Colorado hold, withholding tax, which is about 2%. Doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the buyer. It's just informational. Now we're doing proration of taxes. I always check the box, most recent mill levy and most oops, recent assessed value. And that way it's very fair. Then your association, you if you're gonna get uh, the, it will be the obligation for seller or buyer, whatever. And any special assessments, I would not put on the buyer. I would put on the seller, it's their obligation. They lived on there when the special assessment came. So is there anything else other than their regular assessment? And the word is done. Then if the seller gets a letter saying that the HOA is going to assess an eval, a special assessment, they have to notify the buyers. We're due to get one here in my association because we're trying to settle, settle what it's gonna cost to repair uh, the shingles on the roof since last September. The fires in, in uh, Louisville and Superior hasn't helped the process very much. They are, it's very bad. We're very, they're very, very slow. Okay, 17 is dealing with if the seller does not leave the premise on the day of closing, if that's the day you've decided, and whatever the possession date and time are, it could be a 500. Do not make this $100 a day because if they stay in, it's gonna be hard getting them out. So make it painful for them not to get out on time. 
and you might get a counter on it, but it'll be okay. Make it 500. Now, if the buyer is going to need a, if the seller is going to need a post-closing occupancy agreement, you can check this box and fill out a post-closing occupancy agreement. 18 is dealing with uh, ta uh, losses and what's included in 18 all the way down. You have walkthrough, you have a home warranty in 18.5. Uh, then 19 is dealing with uh, taxes and legal ramifications, and it goes all the way. Specific performance, liquid damage, don't, don't, don't usually check specific performance for any reason. That means the buyer and the seller could be sued for uh, any above the uh, earnest money. So we don't want to do that. The rest of this is per pretty self-explanatory all the way down here to uh, 29. So now that's additional provision. So we want to inform the selling, uh, the listing agent that we have a transaction broker. This is her name, her number. She'll be pay pay handling all the paperwork for the seller um, uh, or the buyer, whichever the case may be, and will be, uh, be the, at, paid at closing by the uh, selling agent or listing agent, either one works. Um, you can change that to selling. If it's a listing, you put listing. If it's by a selling agent, you put buyer. Um, what's included with this property will be, um, Oh, this I put this in the wrong place. Um, this has to be on 30.1. 30 I see that I made an error. Okay, I thought this was changed, but I'll have to double check that. Anyway, earnest money, water source, seller's property disclosure, closing instructions. And if it's a lead-based paint house, you can put that in there. It needs to go to 31 right after the semicolon, which is part of the property here. This should not, this moves up to 31, not 31.1. Then what's not part of it is square footage. So you put that in there. Um, and they may or may not give that to you. It's hard to say, okay? So now you're down here to what you have to fill out. You're the buyer's agent. You feel I does not have earnest money. Is the buyer's agent, listing agent's gonna pay. Fill out all the information here, which is, this is actually the office number uh, that is the actual listing firm's number right there then yours and then all your license number and all of that now I'll go ahead and fill this out for the the listing agent because it about 80 percent of the cases they don't fill this out and they don't sign it but you want to make sure you fill it out so all they have to do as lazy as they are is sign their name any questions to this point Okay, I would strongly suggest this. Go into CTME or to DocuSign, that's free. CTME is $28 a month. Go ahead and fill out a buy-sell contract so you become familiar with one, where can I find it, and two, how to fill it out. And if you need me to look at it, I'm happy to do that. But start getting familiar with these contracts when you can. Donna, I have a question. question. Sure. Well, this is Vicki. Um, what did you say on additional provisions on 30.1.1, just the earnest money check to go up on 30? No, all of that where you see when I see my line here, earnest money, water source addendum, Seller's property disclosure, closing instructions, and lead-based paint, if it applies, needs to go to 30.1. All of them. Okay. Right. I I thought I gave Anna, I mean, uh, Amy, I'm going to have to go back and check that because I thought I corrected that, but may have to do it on another time. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Great question. Great question. Okay. This is an amend extend, and uh, you can um, uh, follow the... Put the dates in. If whatever date you're talking about, that's what you put in here. Okay. This is a temp extension or uh, termination. This is used. This amend extend is used if all parties have already agreed. Hey, I'm going to extend the uh, the loan availability availability deadline, 
or I'm going to do the appraisal deadline or something. Everybody's agreed to that. You can use this one, okay? Now, the one, if you're not sure of what the seller's going to do, and they may back out because they're saying, I'm not giving an extension to the new loan availability uh, deadline. So you could fill this out for the extension or the ex uh, termination. So you put what you want in here. And if they don't, if they're not going to sign that portion, you can check the bottom portion to something that they're going to not extend, which would be new loan review. And you can have your sellers, your buyers sign on this and then send it over to the sellers because that says, hey, Mr. Seller, either sign here or sign here. I and that's, quick question. that's, huh? I have a quick question on um, where we would put something on an amended extend date. Are we only putting the date of the specific item? Not all the new date, not all the- Correct, items. not all the dates. Yeah. It's only the one that you need to use, Holly. Okay. Okay. And you pretty much know with your conversation from the other uh, agent, which, which amend extend you're going to use here, okay? This is notice to terminate. Uh, this is a new one. You can, if you're, you, you're just doing amend extend or you're just not terminating, it can be on inspection. And you, if all parties don't sign, all parties have to sign. And, um, that way uh, you'll get you to get the earnest money back, okay? Okay, who else has a question? I think there's some, there's a document missing. Um, the, the one that's missing is uh, the earnest money release and that document for some reason didn't get loaded in here. So who's got a question on anything? We go in and um, practice filling these out on um, like DocuSign or the CTME. Is there like a guide that we can look at, one that's already kind of filled out similar? That's what this is, Holly. This is where, you know, where you, I told you to go and get all of these documents here. Oh, on the Google. Right. Uh huh. On, on go to Google and, and open that up. And then you, I would suggest strongly that you just print the whole con, all that's there. Okay. Okay. That way you have it and you can see what it looks like. All right. Okay, and, and then you have a copy of what a contract looks like and how to fill it out. If you have any questions, you can always call me. Anybody else have a question? And I, guys, you can come back to this class as often as you want. Next time, which will not be next week, but the following week, I will teach dates and deadlines. So that means how do I plug in my dates and deadlines and who's responsible for what, okay? So it won't be next week, but it'll be the following week. Everybody okay with that? Sounds great. Okay. And everybody, if you don't have any questions, but if you think of one later, either email me or call me uh, with the question or text me, I don't care which way. So. Everybody, go ahead and make your make your own template so you know exactly where to go. And also in CTME and in DocuSign, you'll see where Do, uh, Damien's clauses are. Those are things that you might want to put into a contract for a number of reasons, okay? But if you have a question on it, you can call me. Okay, everybody, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.